was also performed for the Weather Bureau to obtain data for the design of improved television cameras and future weather satellites. From time to time, the astronaut also shot color pictures of scenes selected at random. This picture was taken of the Atlas Mountains of Africa. Now, this is a view of the Himalayas. The Philippine Islands. Major Cooper also proved that deep, normal sleep is possible in a weightless condition, beginning his rest period on the ninth orbit. With occasional interruptions for short reports onto his tape recorder, he slept well for several hours. In addition to the telemetered medical data, awake and asleep, on his heart rate, temperature, respiration and blood pressure, his voice pitch was monitored to determine his psychological condition. The flight proceeded with textbook perfection. Even after the cabin cooling system was turned off and using only the suit cooling system, cabin temperature stabilized at 96 degrees and suit inlet temperature at 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Far less oxygen and attitude control system fuel were used than had been anticipated. During the 15th night, during his 22nd hour in space, astronaut Cooper recorded a personal prayer portions of which follow. I would like to take this time to say a little prayer for all the people. Thank you for the privilege of being here to be in this position, be up in this wondrous place, and all these very startling, wondrous things that you've created. Be with all our family. Let them know that everything will be okay. We ask you in our name. Amen. The textbook flight continued. All systems go, all perfect. On his 16th orbit, astronaut Cooper sent greetings to the summit meeting of African statesmen. Hello, Africa. This is astronaut Gordon Cooper speaking from Faith 7. I am right now over 100 miles above Africa speaking to the Zanzibar station. Just a few minutes ago, I passed Addis Ababa. I want to wish success to your leaders there. Good luck to all of you in Africa. All clear, all systems perfect. Orbits 15, 16, 17, 18. 18 times around the Earth. Orbit 19 began at the 20th minute of the 28th hour. Faith 7 and astronaut Cooper were out of voice contact from Bermuda around more than half the world to Hawaii. Hawaii Capcom, Faith 7. Go ahead, 7, this is Hawaii Region on. Oh, Roger. I wonder if uh, you'd relay to the Cape a uh, little situation I had happened, see what they think on it. While turning uh, my warning lights off and back on to dim, my O5G telelight came on in my telelight panel. The .05 gravity light normally comes on after retro rockets have been fired and the spacecraft has begun to fall toward the Earth. It indicates deceleration on encountering the atmosphere. But Faith 7 was maintaining its orbital path and velocity. Therefore, the question was whether the .05 gravity switch alone had been triggered by a short circuit, or whether the entire automatic control system had skipped the programmed retro rocket and re-entry phase. Astronaut Cooper's message was immediately relayed from Hawaii to Mercury Control Center. By the time he passed over Cape Canaveral, beginning his 20th orbit, NASA and contractor engineers had broken down complete schematic diagrams of the spacecraft and were ready to spell out certain tests for the astronaut to make to determine the seriousness of the unscheduled light. By testing the automatic stabilization and control system's ability to acquire attitudes, astronaut Cooper determined that his ASCS system was not operating. He performed more tests and exchanged information directly with tracking stations and by relay with Mercury Control at Cape Canaveral. A machine seldom makes a mistake, but a machine fails. A man must not fail. Between the man and the spacecraft and the men on the ground, it was determined that astronaut Cooper would have to fire his retro rockets and control re-entry by hand. His autopilot had failed. Without a man to bring the ship down safely, the spacecraft and the mission's most valuable data would have been lost. The task was difficult, but the man was trained. On his final orbit, 
Astronaut Cooper completed final checklists for retrofire and re-entry, reported final data. Each error of one second in timing would cause a five-mile error in landing point. Near midway, at the selected recovery area for the 22nd orbit, the carrier Kearsarge, smaller rescue ships and aircraft, had been alerted and were ready for emergency procedures. A minute error in Faith 7's re-entry attitude could also result in a perilous under or overshoot of the recovery area. At the 30th second of the 56th minute of the 33rd hour of flight, astronaut Cooper contacted John Glenn on the coastal sentry Quebec near Japan. I'm looking for lots of experience on this flight. Are you going to get it? Ten seconds before the 34th hour of flight, to assist astronaut Cooper in the critical timing, John Glenn began the final countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, squib arm, four, three, two, one, fire. Right here, a green on air. Roger, I think I got all three. Roger, how'd you have to do it? Well, pretty fast. Roger, I think so. Astronaut Cooper had fired the retro rockets on the second. He jettisoned his retro pack. As the tremendous speed of the spacecraft re-entering the atmosphere built up a temperature of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the ionized air cut off radio contact for a short time. Now it was a matter of waiting, hoping for contact to be re-established, hoping for accuracy, hoping the chutes would open and hold. Faith 7 was picked up by radar 184 miles out and falling fast. Shortly thereafter, the main parachute was sighted. And so it ended, 34 hours, 20 minutes, 31 seconds. The flight of a man in space 22 times around the Earth, 540,000 miles, farther than to the moon and back, ended within seconds of its program time and within four and a half miles of the carrier Kearsarge. Oh, Roger, I'd like to come aboard the carrier, but they'll grant me permission for an Air Force troop. The flight of Faith 7 was over. A great deal of data was still to be gathered, but from the immediate medical checkout of the astronaut before he emerged from the spacecraft to preliminary post-flight analyses, the flight seemed to have proved man's capability of efficient functioning in a period of prolonged weightlessness in space. As a pilot, astronaut Cooper had come a long way from the time as a six-year-old he was allowed to handle the controls of his father's old single-engine biplane. As a man, he had once again provided proof in a deed of valor that individual men will risk or give their lives so that all men